What is up guys? Welcome back to my YouTube channel or welcome to my YouTube channel if it's your first time here. Today we are starting with a brand new series called Paint and Mystery slash History. This is where I do a painting for you guys and at the same time I tell you about an unsolved mystery or a piece of history or a conspiracy theory. Basically whatever I feel like talking about on that day. Today I will be doing a nice like sunflower field painting, landscape painting is the word I'm looking for, while I tell you about the strange disappearance of D.B. Cooper. Let's jump into the video, shall we? So back in 1971, on the 24th of November, a man calling himself Dan Cooper walked into the Portland International Airport and he bought himself a ticket to Seattle which is in Washington, which is in America. He bought, a cash, uh, okay. he bought a ticket paying cash and he was later described as a man in his mid-40s. They said he was wearing a suit and a tie and a white shirt and like a trench coat, a raincoat business. And he also carried a briefcase and um, a brown paper bag, which I mean. Before they took off, he ordered himself a bourbon and soda, and he had a few cigarettes. On the plane, this is because it was the 70s and people didn't care about nonsense. If you want to smoke on an airplane, go ahead. Who gives a crap? We have other things on our mind. You know, the good old days. <laughs> anyway, uh, they just, they then took off and Mr. Cooper called over the flight attendant lady. Her name was Florence, which is a beautiful name, first of all. I love that name. And he handed her a note. All right. She then took the note and put it in her pocket, which angered Mr. Cooper because he's giving her the note for a reason. I don't know what she was thinking, but she think it's a love note and she'll read it in privacy. I don't know. She then put the note in her pocket, to which Mr. Cooper said, Miss, you better look at that note. I have a bomb. <laughs> it's funny, not the fact that there was a bomb, that is scary, but the fact that um, he was being all on the down low with it, ne? giving her a note all subtly. And then she puts it in her pocket and he has to be like, hello, I have a bomb, get with the program. <laughs> it's funny. Anyway, he then told her to sit down next to him and he opened his briefcase and showed her what's inside the briefcase and it was like a bunch of wires and dynamite looking stickies. It looked very bomby, is what I'm trying to say. He then told Florence to take a note to the cockpit pilot people, the fly people. And while she did that, he told the other stewardess, Tina, that she must stay with him. She is now the middleman. And she spoke it on the phone to the cockpit and that's how they communicated from here on further. Florence then took the note to the cockpit and the note read, quote, I want $200,000 by 5pm in cash. Put it in a knapsack. Like, what is a knapsack? Am I the only one confused about what is a knapsack? I want two back parachutes and two front parachutes. When we land, I want a fuel truck ready to refuel. No funny stuff or I'll do the job. <laughs> It's funny, it sounds so like international man of mystery. No funny stuff or I'll do the job. So like I said, while Mrs. Florence was in the cockpit busy relaying the note to the pilot people, Tina was sitting there being all middle man, middle women, you know. Um, so on the ground, everyone was scrambling to get the money and the parachutes together while the airplane was circling around and around doing a little loopy loop over the Seattle airport. And eventually two hours after this flight was scheduled to land, they landed. And I think the people in the plane who had like meetings was very pissed at Mr. Cooper. Like I have things to do and you are holding us up with your bombs and stuff. Also apparently, a lot of the people on the plane didn't even know that they were being hijacked when they landed. They did not know what was going on. Um, which is the level of minding my own business that I 
aspire to, you know? Anyway, so uh, the plane landed, Mr. Cooper exchanged the passengers and some of the crew members for the money and the parachutes. And eventually, um, Mr. Cooper and four of the crew members, the pilots and two flight attendants, set it off again. And Mr. Cooper requested that the, fly, the plane fly below 10,000 feet. He said he wants the back staircase thing in the block, the one that's under the airplane, he wants that to remain open. And yes, he wants to go to Mexico City as his end destination. They tried to, to meet all of Mr. Cooper's demands because he had a bomb. But unfortunately, two of his demands could not be met. Okay, the pilot told him, listen, we cannot go one way to, to um, Mexico City without stopping for a refuel. It's just not physically possible. And I mean, we don't want to crash, preferably. So eventually they reached the agreement that they would stop the refuel at Nevada, uh, Reno, Nevada. And also the pilot told him, listen, we cannot take off with the back think case thingy open. It's not possible. It's under the plane. How are we going to take off with this giant staircase uh, open? So Mr. Cooper said, fine, um, we can take off with it closed. But as soon as we are in the air, we need to open it again. Because um, I have a jump scheduled. I want to jump out of this bloody plane. So they took off again towards Reno, Nevada, where the refueling would happen. And about five minutes into this flight, Mr. Cooper told the, the, the flight attendant lady that she must leave now. Go to the cockpit. I do not want to be disturbed any further. Which, I mean, it's rude, if you ask me. Um, first, you threaten her with a bomb, and then you... You ask her to do a bunch of stuff and then you chase her away. I think it's a bit rude, but anyway, that's just my opinion. The last time this flight attendant lady saw Mr. Cooper, he was in the middle of an aisle, of the aisle, big aisle thingy, and she said it looked like he was doing his preparations to jump. He put it on a wraparound sunglasses, which is now part of the infamous sketch that we all see of D.B. Cooper. And she then locked herself into the cockpit, and um, that's the last time she saw him. When they landed in Reno, Nevada, to refuel, they came out slowly and forsichtig, and Mr. Cooper was nowhere to be found. So, obviously, somewhere between Seattle and Reno, Mr. Cooper jumped. The FBI then came to investigate the plane and look for clues, but there wasn't m many clues, you know. He left behind a his clip-on tie, which, I mean, it ruins it for me. The fact that he is this international man of mystery, James Bond wannabe, um, he's like, I have a bomb, no funny stuff, I'll do the job, uh, give me a, a, a bourbon and soda, and then he takes off his clip on tie. It doesn't make sense. Anyway, so they found the clip on tie which he left behind and they found eight cigarette butts because he smoked on the airplane because it's the 70s. Uh, that's basically all they found and him and the bomb and the suitcase and the money and two of the parachutes were gone. So somewhere he jumped out of the plane. Now the FBI had to figure out when he jumped and where he jumped. Okay, and because no one physically saw him jump out of the plane, the crew couldn't be much help in that regard. But you know, these people are clever and they uh, used a few formulas and some clues to determine more or less when he jumped and where he jumped. Which we can never be certain of because it's just a guessing game at this point because no one saw him jump out of the plane. The strange thing that we found out later is that Mr. Cooper did not request a specific flight plan. The pilot chose the flight plan. Um, before takeoff, the pilot wanted to do the flight plan with Mr. Cooper and he said, no, just, let's just get the show on the road was his specific word. So he wasn't interested in, in 
giving his own flight plan, which tells me he did not have a plan of exactly where he's going to jump out, like someone waiting for him. Like, everything was very well planned up until the point where he jumped, it seems to me. Ah, I need a bit of coffee. So after the FBI came up with a more or less when he jumped, where he jumped, they started to do an extensive search and they ended up finding Fogel. To this day, Mr. Cooper has never been found, no body, no suitcase, no, no parachute, no nothing. Nothing has been found. Like, if, since today, it's very weird. In the year following, this Mr. Cooper hijacking business, two men has, was arrested for pretending to be D.B. Cooper and trying to sell their tell-all story to the tabloids. Which, look, I understand, we all have to make a living here. We are all just trying our best. But I have to believe that there are better ways of doing it than trying to impersonate a criminal. Like, even when you are impersonating someone, you are choosing someone who did wrong things, you know? Does not make sense to me. Nine years, almost a decade after this D.B. Cooper business, a little boy found a little paper bag filled with $20 bills on a beach, okay? And they knew about the D.B. Cooper case. They knew that the ransom was all in $20 bills, which D.B. Cooper requested specifically. So his parents gave the money in at the police, which, I mean, very great job. Very proud of you for giving in the money. Not a lot of people would do that. Like, a lot of children would find that money and go and buy themselves a hundred safe stockies. Anyway, uh, the FBI then checked the money and the serial ma numbers matched the money that they gave as a ransom to D.B. Cooper. And all in all, it was just over $5,800. And that's the only money that's ever been recovered. Now, there was a lot of questions like, how did the money end up there? Because it made no sense. It didn't make sense according to where he jumped out of. And it just didn't make sense. And they ended up coming to the conclusion that it had to come there by human intervention. So either D.B. Cooper put it there or someone found the money and put it there. So someone might have found D.B. Cooper's body and then looted, looted his body. And then that's how they came across the money. Don't know. No way to for sure say. Like everything in this case, everything is a bloody mystery. Hence, paint and mystery. <laughs> so now we can get into some of the theories and the suspects. Now, first of all, the suspects in this case spans into the hundreds. There are hundreds of suspects and theories. And it's impossible to put all of them here. So I'm just going to cover a few of the more interesting options. Suspect number one, Richard Floyd McCoy. Can we just all agree that that is one bloody cool name, eh? It sounds like the real McCoy. <laughs> anyway, five months after the D.B. Cooper um, hijacking, this man, Richard McCoy, was arrested for, get this, hijacking a plane. And the hijacking that McCoy did fit the MO of what D.B. Cooper did. It had the same MO and his note also contained the phrase, no funny stuff. Which, I mean, sounds uh, compelling to me. McCoy's family also apparently identified one of the items that D.B. Cooper left behind on the plane when he did his hijacking. This sounds a bit weird to me. Like what item? Why are they not telling us what item? Because what we know were found on the plane was a tie and cigarette butts. So how can... I don't know, it doesn't sound very um, interesting to me. But this Mr. McCoy was sentenced for the hijacking that he was caught in. He was sentenced to 45 years in prison, but he then escaped because he's 
very clever. And then he promptly got shot in an FBI shootout and he died. Um, I guess the lesson that I want to teach you today is stay to crime. It doesn't pay. Well, sometimes it does, but not in the long, long run. Don't, don't do crime kids. Do nice jobs. <laughs> anyway, so that is our first suspect. Suspect number two is a guy named Dwayne Weber. Okay? He claimed to be D.B. Cooper on his deathbed. While he was busy dying, he went, um, I have a secret to tell you. I am Dan Cooper. Which um, his wife then said, like that's what he said just before he died. And she said it started to put a lot of things into perspective for her. Because then suddenly she remembered. Um, he often had nightmares about leaving fingerprints on a plane. He also had a terrible knee injury that he claimed to have gotten when jumping out of a plane. He also apparently went to that beach where they found the money. He was at that beach at some point where the boy found the, the, the money, you know. And his wife is now telling people this, telling the police this. I'm like, where have you been? Why haven't you told them before? She also said that he had an old northern, northwestern plane ticket for no apparent reason. If that's the case, why is the case not solved? Because if he had a ticket, the name on the ticket would most say Dan Cooper. So, I don't know, there's something fishy here. It's just, it falls into place too nicely. You know what I mean? So, the third suspect is a man named Kyle Christensen. And his brother, Lyle Christensen, watched an episode of Unsolved Mysteries and he became convinced that his brother was D.B. Cooper. Um, he cites a deathbed confession, another deathbed, deathbed confession, where his brother, just before dying, looked at, at Lyle and said, I have a secret to tell you, but I can't. And then he died. <laughs> uh, talk about a cliffhanger. Anyway, this um, doesn't seem plausible to me, to be honest, but they did rule him out, more or less, because he didn't fit the, the physical description. Also, um, Mr. Christensen was a very skilled jumper, he was like a paratrooper and according to the FBI they don't think Dan Cooper was experienced because he made a lot of stupid choices. Which brings us into the final theory for today and that is the theory that he is all sorts of dead. Hashtag deceased, you know. Because they cite a lot of reasons for this theory. First of all, no experienced jumper would jump in the middle of the night with very, very strong winds and low visibility. Apparently, he jumped in a like wooded area and there was trees all below him and um, you couldn't see below you while you were jumping because of the clouds. So, he also chose... The, one of the parachutes that they sent at him was a training shoot that was so shut and he didn't notice the difference which is also weird. The thing about this theory is like I said no body has ever been found. Wouldn't it have been found by now? Not only that, the parachutes hasn't been found, the briefcase hasn't been found, nothing has been found on this guy. So I guess this story will remain a bloody mystery. That is until we can find something in, like conclusive. What do you guys think happened to D.B. Cooper? The B, by the way, is, was like a mistake that was made by the newspapers. Um, so no one knows where the B comes from. He's, he never called himself D.B. Cooper. He said Dan Cooper. But anyway, that's on a side note. What do you guys think happened to him? I would like to think about this like very, very old whammy sitting on a beach somewhere counting his $20 bills. Huh? Wouldn't that be nice? But I think he's, he's probably dead six. That is what I think. What do you guys think? Also, let me know what 
mystery, conspiracy, piece of history, you would like me to cover next week. And I will see what I can do. Remember to subscribe. Thank you, Roof Kuiper. Okay, we'll chat again next time. Bye-bye. Remember to subscribe down below.